May we stand for our call to worship for this afternoon revival. Our call to worship is Psalm 92. It says, it is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto thy name, O Most High, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. Upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with the solemn sound. For thou, Lord, hast made me glad through thy work. I will triumph in the works of thy hands. I conclude with verse 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Can we take a moment before we pray is to give God some praise and give God worship. Just be so thankful and grateful. It is a good thing to give thanks. It is a good thing to give thanks. We bless you. We bless you. You may be seated. As I understand it, I can't go further if God's spirit is not in the building. I've learned not to assume that God will always show up. Even with the expectation, I know that his spirit is gentle and I must welcome him in this place. Is that okay? That we take a moment and welcome God in this place? Yes. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you have been with us through this morning. You received that worship. No, now, Lord God, we have gathered here for a revival. We've gathered here because we need an extra push. We need a restart. Someone needs a recharge. But we know in order to do that, we must be hooked up to the main power switch. So we need you in this building. Fill this room. Not only this room, but fill the vestibule. Not only the vestibule, but fill the parking lot. Wherever, where someone is on this campus, oh God, bless them. We pray, Lord, that our music would reach heaven. We pray that our prayers will be a sweet-smelling savor unto you. All we want to do is please you. All we want to do is worship you. Receive our worship, O oh Lord. Receive our gifts. We present gifts and we present our bodies, our entire mind. And we pray, Lord, that, that we'll be open to the word of God that we shall receive, that it will do us some good. This is our prayer in Jesus. So wonderful and faithful name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'm going, I wanted to have our own main choir to open up. I believe that's just uh, it's important that, that we as Holland Chapel welcome you here. And it starts with our choir. So we're going to ask the men if they would bring a selection. And then followed by that, I'll give you some more instructions about our offering, and then we will have the praise team uh, from Mitchell Chapel to sing. Okay. Thank you. I'm running for my life, 
for running cause I want to see Christ. I've made up in my mind I'm going to run while I see you got time, got to run. So got to run. Every day I got to run. So got to run. While the blood keeps running warm in my veins. When I hear those church bells toll, I stop and I wonder, Lord, how long I see the hearse wheels. They roll into, then I tell myself, that could be you, i am got to run. i am got to run. Every day I gotta run. I gotta run. Why the blood keeps running warm in my veins? When the eyes of my eyes is closed and the blood in my veins is cold. When I step out of life back door, I won't be able, y'all. Then I can't run no more. I've got to run. I've got to run. Every day I've got to run. I've got to run. Why the blood keeps running warm in my veins? I gotta run. I gotta run. I gotta run. Hills get high, but I gotta run. Valley's getting low, but I gotta run. Steps get real slow, I gotta run. Friends are gone, but I gotta run. Sometimes it looks like I just can't make it. Heels all around me, enemies come behind me. I ain't got no way to go, but I'm still awake. Look up. And I tell him, run, 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 gotta run, 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 gotta run, 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 gotta, gotta, gotta run, 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 gotta run, run, run. Why the blood keeps running warm in my veins? Allow them to come down as Mrs. Taffer praise team. They're here to render the rest of the music. Thank you, man. Give them another round of applause. Thank you for our men. read a particular scripture that I believe that captures the moment of our revival this afternoon and it's found in the Old Testament from the prophet Joel the second chapter verse 18 please listen to these words from the prophet Joel chapter 2 verse 18 then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. 
Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastors of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that had death wondrously with you. And my people should never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and no one else. And my people shall never be ashamed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You can clap your hands. That's good news right there. At this time, I'll ask the Mitchell Chapel praise team if they would render us uh, at least two selections, and then I will introduce uh, the beloved speaker for this hour, and, and then we'll follow by uh, another selection. Testing. Mic check. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. That's what he is to me. Jehovah Jireh. That's what he is to me, Jehovah. Jehovah. 
That's what he is to me. Jehovah, Jireh, my provider. That's what he is to me. Jehovah, Jireh, my provider. That's what he is to me. Jehovah, Jireh, my what he is to me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. That's what he is to me. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. That's what he cares for you and when you're in doubt and you can't find your way out he will see you through yes he will see you through yeah. see you through
Jesus, 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 Jesus. some revival.
Hallelujah. 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 You know, revival don't start into a cool sweat run the back of your head. It ha now y'all warmed up. It, you, now we, we better have revival. Sometimes I try to think outside the box, and I was thinking of how to create a revival, and I was looking, and it said, book a speaker, create a flyer, Consider special needs. Set up a time, but not one time in that program it said you need to have the Holy Spirit in there. And it's, you can't do a revival if you don't have God moving through the pews. You can have all that other stuff. It can look really nice and pretty. But I, see, that's why I didn't wear a tie, because in revival, I want to, be, I want to let God use me. I can't be all tied up and can't move. I know it's been a pandemic. Y'all haven't been a revival. I know everybody's looking nice. They, I understand. I understand. But just to let you know, if there's plenty of room to remove your hairpiece, sit it on the side. <laughs> that goes for men and women. It is okay. You can adjust it later. We will be all right. Allow God to have his way. Listen, um, this, is a, this is a special, unique treat for me where I get to introduce this. Uh, this I, I will already say he's, he's a legend, especially in, in my eyes, because um, he is, Reverend Corey Little, is the first cousin to my wife, Renita. And that's how I was introduced to him and also introduced to Zion. I met uh, Reverend Corey D. Little in 1997, and um, we were back there like old men trying to find out <laughs> what, yeah, I know he was preaching, and I remember his sister, his wife, Nisa Little, was singing, and, um, but I d we, can't, we can't remember where we were, what was going on, but that's my first introduction, and when Later in the years, uh, when I finished up at Central at Nursing School, and we were in Durham, and we were looking for a church home, and we found out, hey, cousin is, he is, is, is pastoring over at Mount Olive. And that's how we knew, we knew, we didn't know anything. I grew up Baptist, so I knew nothing about AME Zion or AME, had no idea. And <laughs> so we, we joined um, that ministry, uh, and um, I did my trial sermon actually up under Reverend Corey Little. Yes, my trial sermon. Amen. <laughs> so it's a full circle. And um, in the most trying time was a what we heard was called annual conference for the first time. And I said, he said, well, you know, you can go if you want to. It might be crowded or so. They had it at Hillside. It was so packed. We went there, it was just so packed. Me and my wife said, let's go to KNW. <laughs> Nobody ain't gonna see us. He don't even know we're here. <laughs> I knew nothing about what annual conference was. So we went to KNW. We were just eating. He said, this is nice. We get a Sunday off every year. I said, this is really nice. And while I was there, we got a phone call on one of the members crying. He's gone, he's gone. I said, oh my God, he, where'd he go? We, did, we, got, we didn't know what happened. So he gone. They sent him away. And I said, go where? He's like, he at another church. And it threw us because we didn't know anything about you. We were only appointed for a year. And it, <laughs> I was like, he forgot to tell us about that. <laughs> and he had to describe, oh, well, you know, and I think he may have thought I understood, but I did not know that. And, but bec because... We had become, we fell in love with Mount Olive. He said, it's going to be all right. And, um, and he moved on to Fayetteville. 
and but he has been keeping up with us ever since and been really investing in my spiritual development as well as my wife and always stayed in touch and then when he circled back to Mitchell Chapel and again we were I was looking at possibly starting a church in Burlington and I wanted the covering somewhere nearby and then I found myself right up under Corey Little at Mitchell Chapel and I joined Mitchell Chapel Amen. So, I, look, we just, I, I, I don't know what was going on, but I didn't want to leave his side. <laughs> and I said, look, I told him, I said, look, if it don't work out for Harlem Chapel, I'll be right back over there to Mitchell. <laughs> I said, I told him, I said, have me a seat. <laughs> but those are just my personal <laughs> reflections. I never met with that yell. That yell threw me off when that lady called and said you were gone. I, I was hoping you didn't go to glory. Uh, <laughs> Yes, uh, yes, you're glad. You're still here. You made it. <laughs> well, Reverend Courtney Little, he is from Mount Gilead. That is my wife's hometown. That's my roots of my, uh, my family. Uh, he was raised, graduated from West Montgomery High School. And I wanted to mention a few things, because sometimes as pastors, no one, like, reads everything that we've done. And, and we've accomplished a lot, and it deserves to be read. Um, he currently serves as a pastor of Mitchell Chapel, Amy Zion. Where you are, Mitchell Chapel? Come on. <laughs> Yes, they are here. Y'all are wonderful. I love me some Mr. Chapel. Y'all all right with me. He resides in Pittsburgh. He's been married for 28 years. He is just as crazy as I am, my wife. 28 years to his high school sweetheart, the Reverend Anissa T. Little. Y'all know her. Y'all know her. Uh, they have two sons, Darren and Jared. Jared's here. Amen. Senior at Central, right? He's senior at Central. And he, he didn't put it in here, but I'm going to go ahead. So Naya is their daughter here. <laughs> Naya, we know that. That's, that's their other daughter. That's their daughter there. Naya, come on. Thank you. He served in the Army National Guard after high school while attending North Carolina State University. I overlooked that. I'll, it's okay. That's okay. He later attended the University of North Carolina at Pembroke and graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Philosophy and Religion and a minor in Sociology. And is currently in a Master's Divinity student uh, at Hood Theological Seminary. Amen. <laughs> Here's a little bit of things that he did prior to becoming a f in full-time ministry. He worked in the Wake County Public School System in the Department of Student Services, helping students with special needs, making a transition from school to adult life. Um, later in 97, he identif he, this is where he identified his purpose in life when he was called into preaching ministry. A short time after preaching his trial sermon, he was entrusted with his first pastoral appointment at Glover's Grove, Amy Zion, in Siler City. Under his leadership, this church moved from a circuit church to a full station church with services every Sunday and doubled the weekly attendance. After two and a half years, Reverend Little was appointed to Corinth, Amy Zion Church, also in Silo City. He faithfully led and served the congregation for four years. He was then appointed to serve the Mount Olive Amy Zion Church in Durham, North Carolina, where he also served for four years. Then in November of 2009, which I will always remember, he was a Bishop Thompson appointed Reverend Little to the historic Evans Metropolitan Church in Fayetteville, North Carolina, uh, where he served for a number of years, maybe 10 years, possibly seven years, seven years. And then in the year of 2015, he was appointed a senior pastor at Mitchell Chapel AME Zion Church. <laughs> Amen. In Pittsburgh. So in each church, Reverend Little, Little, as you can see, has been actively involved in community service. And while in Siler City, he served on the executive committee of the Siler City Council of Churches. The Council of Churches is an organization that develops community enhancement and awards scholarships to graduates in the area. While he was in Durham, he worked with the Walltown Community Development Organization that provided community enhancement through safety and security, sports and program, and human service. He in Fayetteville, the church conducted a weekly feeding program and distributed thousands of clothing, shoes, and other articles to people in the community. He leaves with this, it is a sacred trust to serve the church in various locations and serve many different people, but it remains to be seen what God has in store for Pastor Little and Mitchell Chapel Amy Zion Church. 
And what he cherishes most is the opportunity to share words of faith, inspiration, and encouragement with the people God places in his path. And I can say as a witness, he loves family. He, he loves them. He takes them wherever he can. And I have seen his boys and daughter from little be raised up. And, and I'm learning how to take care of my children in ministry. And that's one thing I, I watched them both. They did not neglect their family because of ministry. And I, didn't, I did not uh, accept this call to lose my family. Amen. 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 So I appreciate you <laughs> giving me a template and a way to raise my children. Amen. So without further ado, I want to have uh, another selection uh, by uh, this wonderful praise team. And then we will have the voice of Reverend Corey D. Little. testing. He made a way for anybody out there. And didn't he open some doors? No. 
Sing it. Sing it with us one more time. Sing it. Oh, Come on, lift your hands in worship. As we prepare for the word, let's worship him. He's worthy. Ooh, can we sing it? Spirit, yeah. have your way. Yeah. Yes. Oh, One more time, let's sing yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, Jesus, there's no Nobody like you. Nobody, 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 no. There's no one like you. There's no one like you. Amen. One more time, put your hands together for this praise team. But most of all, put your hands together for the God, for the God who we celebrate. There's no one like you, Lord. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who's in all. 
through all and over all. There's no one like God. Somebody give God a real praise. Praise him like you know he's God all by himself. Praise him like you know that God is responsible for your being here. Praise him because you trust in God to bring you through all your ups and all your downs. Shout. Thank you all so very much. I'll take just a few moments in preliminaries and then get to the preaching of the Word of God. I first of all have to say thank you so much to uh, so many of my family members who are here, as you have already heard. I had to check with uh, Reverend Matthews to make sure I wasn't seeing double because sometimes these glasses mess up on me. It's been a while since I've had my prescription updated, but um, my twin cousins, thank you all so very much. It's so good to see you, Keita and Nita. Y'all, let me be me for just a moment. I'm, I'll be open and honest and say it took me a long time to be able to tell the two of them apart, even though we were closely related and lived essentially across the road from each other. And now that both of them are behind masks, I still can't tell who is who. Um, but both of y'all are there. Both of y'all are there, right there, right there. My mom is here. Thanks for coming, mom. And my auntie and my uncle are here. Thank you all for being present. Our extended family, my grandmother's namesake, Miss Lillian Little, God bless you. Thank you for coming. Amen. And let me say one more thing, just one more thing. Y'all hurry up and sit down. You're taking my attention. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Y'all are good. Y'all are my people. When everybody else done let me down, I can count on y'all. Those, those two right there, I can count on them. The one other thing that I wanted to say as Reverend Matthews was um, describing how we were back in the back like men of very old age trying to determine what was happening at what year and at what time. Um, what he did describe was uh, early in my ministry, God blessed me to be able to serve Glover's Grove Church and when he read it, it immediately clicked in my mind that I went to Glover's Grove after this praying woman had been there, and I had no choice but to do well because she had done prayed all the demons out. <laughs> Reverend Wilson, bless you. God bless you. I, I have to say that my ministry might be where it is today because of all the prayers that you prayed and saturated the ground and turned over the hell of the fellow soil and got stuff ready for, for me. Didn't know what I was doing, young, inexperienced, untrained, but because of your prayers, God made it work. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. To the Reverend Anissa Little and to Jared Little, who, as I aforementioned, are my closest support system. Thank God for you all as well. Reverend Matthews is right. We try to stick together and try to stay with family because when all else is said and done, these are who we have. Amen. All of us. 
There is a word from the Lord. I want to invite your attention for the next few moments to the gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. I'm going to read it from the New International Version, and I'm going to go a little bit slow right now to give everybody an opportunity to find it so that you can read it along with me. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. The word reads as follows, saying, Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city, a blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout. Some, tri some translations say cry out, uh, but he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. On your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi or teacher, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. I got a thought and a theme from this text for your consideration in this season of revival. The thought is this, the cry of faith that causes a comeback. Akin to that, I want you to also think about it like this. Shout until your story makes sense. So you can't shout on that if you ain't dealing with some struggles right now. You can't shout on that if your life right now isn't rocking and reeling just a little bit. You can't shout on that right now if you're not going through some dangers, some toils, and snares. But if you're in a season that your story is topsy-turvy, if you're in a season where it just doesn't look right, doesn't sound right, ain't making sense, then I challenge you, I encourage you, I inspire you to shout unto the Lord until your story begins to make sense. Thank you, God. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to stand and to declare your word of truth. I pray now, O oh God, that you will anoint me, endow me afresh with preaching power that makes preaching possible and effective. Guide me now, thy great Jehovah, as we pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak within myself, O oh God, but you are so mighty in your powerful, powerful hand. Hold us now, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Shout until your story makes sense. I'm convinced that great hardship and loss can be such a heavy weight that sometimes people are not able 
to recover from them. Sometimes it's this kind of weight that causes a church to be lulled to sleep into lethargy and apathy. It's this kind of weight that sometimes causes folks to just not make it out. The depth of life's adversities can also create the greatest capacity for faith. I need to pause right there for just one moment and ask somebody who don't mind testifying that if it hadn't been for your trouble, you would not have prayed like you prayed. If it hadn't been for your hardship, you would not have drawn as close to God as you have come. If it hadn't been for your issue, you wouldn't have sought the kind of help that you sought out in order to help you get through. If it hadn't been for the trouble that found its way into your life, you would have never called on the name of the Lord. But for some of us, it's the issue, it's the trouble, it's the hardship that opened the door of the kingdom and drew us to the throne room of God and beckoned us to call on his name and cry out because things just didn't make sense. Lord, we need you. Difficulty has been known to drive people into deep depressions. Depression results from complex interactions of social, psychological, and biological factors. People have gone through adverse events in their lives, such as unemployment, bereavement, psychological trauma, and otherwise, and they are even more likely to develop depression. Depression can then in turn lead to more series of stress and dysfunction, and a person's life is left worse off than just the depression itself. But sometimes, misfortune can also serve as that which prompts us to make a comeback. Take for just a moment to consider with me the life of a young 13-year-old girl, Bethany Hamilton, who was surfing in the ocean when all of a sudden her arm was bitten off by a shark. But after months of surgery, she made a comeback, surfing again on a modified board, having to learn how to do the sport with just one arm. Can I talk to some of us? Some of us have been like Bethany, where life has taken a bite out of you. Sometimes life will take a bite out of your peace, take a bite out of your blessings, take a bite out of your, come on here somebody, have you ever had life to bite you in the backside? Sometimes life can bite you, and as a matter of fact, we look at people who are walking around every day, walking slow, with their heads down, their appearance dropped, it's because they are fragmented from all of the things that have bitten them in life. They are fragmented because the relationship bit them up. They are fragmented because their finances are bitten up. They are fragmented because their peace of mind, their help, their love, their hope, all of it has been taken a bite out of it. And folks are left wondering, what's left for me? to do. I challenge us today to get to the point that even when life has taken a bite out of you, then with whatever it is you have left, keep on kicking. Uh, when Jared was small, one of me and Jared's favorite movies was Finding Nemo. Something happened to Nemo. Y'all don't know about Nemo. Nemo is a little clownfish who got trapped in a fishing net in the sea. Nemo had a friend, Dory. Dory was more of a nuisance than a friend, but Dory had some good theology. When Nemo couldn't get out of the trap of the net and the other fish were pressing down on him, she told him, Dory said, Nemo, if you want to make it out, just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. And the more they swam, 
the more the tide turned. The more they swam, the more things began to open up. I just want to say to you that you ought to adopt a finding Nemo theology. That when life gets hard, just keep swimming. When you're getting taken bites out of your life, just keep swimming. If you just keep swimming, just keep pressing, just keep focused, just keep going. Sometimes your ability to keep going will propel you past the problems that have been biting on you kicking at you, trying to steal your joy, just keep swimming. When problem people call you on the phone, they ain't got to know what you're doing, just do this. Just keep swimming. When jokers get on your nerves and you're trying to hold your religion, just keep swimming. In the text, for our consideration, we encounter a man who is very familiar with adversity. In fact, he's so familiar with misfortune that his name appears to be a part of, his misfortune appears to be a part of his name. When the text tells us who he is, it also tells us about his calamity. Are y'all with me? Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar. You know, when your destiny has been derailed, then your calamity becomes your claim to fame. It's when everybody knows you, not because of who you are, but because of your mistake. When everybody knows you, not because of what you do well, but because of what you've done wrong. Isn't it powerful how you can do well for years and years? Make one mistake, and folks will remember that one mistake more than all of the faithful years that you have served. That you come on here, somebody. Well, what was wrong with Bartimaeus is that he was burdened by one of life's blinding blows. Life can hit you hard, and this man was suffering from one of them. By his own admission, we discover that blindness was not a condition of his from birth. He said in response to Jesus, I want to see again. Life circumstances had hit him so hard that it took from him what most of us take for granted every day. But be careful what we take for granted because it can be gone before we realize it. Sometimes, like Bartimaeus, it may not be blindness, but sometimes we get blindsided with the kind of troubles that make you say, I just didn't see that coming. Sometimes it hits us at a point where we don't know what to do. Because of his condition, it weighed so heavily upon him for so long, it left him broken down and begging. Now, we're living in an era right now where ladies and men are living to pursue their hopes and dreams and aspirations, and everybody is trying to make something more of themselves. Nobody wants to find themselves begging. Now, I've never been a woman, God. I don't want to be. I'm not trying to transgender or anything. All I want to say is that I can speak from the male perspective because I've been one all my life. But a brother who is trying to make something of himself don't want to beg for anything from anybody. I wish I could get some witnesses in the house. I mean, you don't, even want, you don't even want to go to daddy and ask daddy for anything. When you get a certain age, especially as a man, you don't want, you don't want to have to depend on. I said to my grandmother, you've been good to me. The one thing I wanted to do, Uncle Sonny, I never wanted to have anyone take care of me when I left home. 
So I didn't even make all the right decisions. But I ain't go back home for somebody to have to take care of me. I made some messed up decisions. Some stuff I ain't tell nobody. Come on here, somebody. There are some things, whenever they put you in that vault and lock it down and put dirt over it, some stuff you just going to take on down there. I need a few folks that don't mind testifying that there are some things that nobody will ever know. Begging diminishes your dignity. Begging causes you to feel the distinct feeling of being beneath what God has called you to be. Begging, it seems to be the kind of element in life that puts us on a plane that you're less than human. This man was bitten and broken to the point that the only way he could make it was to stand outside and beg from people who were coming to the temple or who were passing by on the roadside. Here it is. I think I got some more stuff in my notes, but I ain't trying to preach all of it. Here it is. The kind of faith that shouts out to make you come back is the kind of faith that refuses to be silent. Come on here, somebody. I mean, even though he was broken, he had made up in his mind that, look, I'm in a bad set of circumstances, but when he heard that Jesus was passing by, he said, I may have been stuck, but I ain't staying silent. He shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And the more he cried out, people tried to tell him to shut up. It's amazing how sometimes people, we're living in a culture that is known for devaluing the voices of people that live on the margins. Uh, devaluing the voices of people who are not prominent in society. So they were seeking to shut his voice voice down but the more they told him to shut up he the more he shouted because it just didn't make sense to him I believe that something was happening in him sometimes something on the inside starts working on the outside Jeremiah said it this way I said I wasn't going to tell it said I was going to get somewhere and sit down but when I took my seat tried to hold my peace, pressed my lips together, concentrated on my silence, something within me. Begin working out of me. I opened up my mouth. I shouted unto the Lord, said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but it was like fire. Shut up in my bones sometimes when folk try to shut you down you just got to keep on shouting until it makes sense here it is the Lord gave him the opportunity because he said to the folks call him to me bring him to me so not only must be must we be willing to shout when others are trying to shut you down, you also have to respond in faith to the Lord's call. So the Bible described that he threw his cloak to the side. He jumped up from where he was, and he ran speedily to where Jesus had called him. Sometimes I think that we get so settled and satisfied in our stuff that sometimes even when the Lord shows up, we act like ain't nothing happened. Some folks want to sit down in their seat with their legs crossed, their arms crossed, their eyes crossed, sucking on their teeth, acting like I don't care what happened, ain't nothing going to move me. I don't care who shows up, who preaching, what's going on, ain't nothing going to move me. But I wish I had some witnesses who are just waiting for an opportunity for the Lord to call. Waiting for, I heard 
in my church growing up that I want to be somewhere listening for my name. May not have it all together, but if he calls me, I'm going to be ready. May not have made all the right decisions, but when he calls me, I'm going to be ready to get up, get in line, because I want to be in that number when the saints go marching in. I want to be in the number. I may not be in the front, but as long as I'm in the number. When the saints go marching in, he just he demonstrated a kind of faith that refused to stay silent. He demonstrated the kind of faith that responds to the call of Jesus. And when I close this out, he demonstrated the kind of faith that rejoiced by following the Lord where Jesus went. See, we don't get all that excited about that. Because it doesn't seem all that charismatic. But can I say something to us? When you've been beat up enough and you find some safety, you get excited about that. When you have been betrayed by people and folks have tried to shut you down and you finally find somebody who's willing to listen to your cry to listen to your call, to listen to your need, to respond to your desire, to help you get back in place, to help you get back online, to help you get back on top, then there's something powerful about that. We see the response of a life that had been broken but is now blessed and healed. Verse 52, when he takes off behind Jesus, is an example of what it means to have an attitude of gratitude. It is apparent that Bartimaeus came to the conclusion that what the Lord has done for me is more valuable than I could ever pay the Lord back. So since I can't pay God back, then I'm just going to give God back what God gave to me. Give him my whole life. Give him my whole heart. Give him my whole self. Give him my whole being. Give him my whole existence. Give him my entire self. Give somebody ought to tell God, I'm giving back to God what God has given to me. Old saints used to say it this way. Where he leads me, I will follow I can remember Lillian singing that song. Her voice, she'd go up in that alto tone and say, I'll go with him, with him all the way. So I couldn't fully understand what it meant then, but I understand now when the Lord has saved you, wherever he goes, you want to go where God is. When the Lord has blessed you, whatever God is doing. You want to be where the move of God is. Whenever God has rescued you, no matter where he leads you, you want to follow. As I take my seat, I put it that way, but I like the way J. Moss put it in the song that he made popular, talking about a shout on the inside. He says, there's a praise. Coming up from the depths of my soul. Excuse me if I get a little giddy and a little bit strange. But praise is the way I say thanks. Somebody ought to tell God thank you. I don't know how you tell God thank you. But when I look back over my life and I see how good God has been, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for saving me. There's a praise on the inside. And I can't help but tell God, thank you for picking me up, for turning me around, for placing my feet 
on solid ground. Thank you for standing by my bedside as I slumber and sleep at night. The angels of God watching over us day and night. Tell God, thank you. Sometimes, sometimes we have to thank God in advance because of God's promises. We ain't seen it all come to reality yet, but he promised that there is a place that he's going to prepare for us. If it were not so, he would have said so. But in our Father's house, some say there is a mansion with many rooms. And there's one with all of our names ready when we get ready to respond to God in faith, to follow the Lord in his mission, to be faithful to God with our purpose in life. And when we realize that we're here, not because of our strength, our intellect, our family, our connections, our e economic status. We're not here because of any of those realities. We're here because God looked into our future, recognized that there was a predisposition, that there is a prevenient grace that he had caused to work on our behalf, that even while we were still a mess, some was speaking to us, some was nudging us, calling us, pulling at us. And ultimately, even when we couldn't vocalize what it was, there is an assurance that God has had God's hands on us since before we were formed in our mother's womb. And God has greater. God has a plan and a purpose. I knew I was in the right place. I just had to get the right direction. God has a plan and a purpose for each of us. So when your story is not making sense, shout to the Lord. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. It's powerful. Would you stand together with me as we stand just momentarily. There may be someone who feels the urge to make a recommitment to God. Maybe there's someone in the midst of our gathering today who has not made the first commitment to God. That commitment which requires less of us, but all of Christ. Whenever Jesus shed his blood on Calvary's cross and the power of God raised Jesus from the dead to new life, that prevenient grace that covering clears our debt but just like blind Bartimaeus there has to be a ready response we got to get up from our spot move forward into accepting receiving accepting embracing the grace of God that saves if there's someone that needs to be saved this is your day this is your time this is your opportunity while the Lord is speaking, maybe there's someone who needs to make a decision to rededicate. That's really what revival is about. Revival really isn't all about trying to bring in sinners and the unsaved. Revival really is about saying to those of us who have been serving, who have been in place, who have been in the spaces, who have been sustaining the work, whenever life has taken a bite out of you and has beaten you down or you just get tired and weary. God is saying, come, come, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Sometimes the rededication is in order. Would you come? Maybe, maybe today you simply want to stand where you are and just acknowledge God for who God is and for what God has done in your life. Maybe Maybe this was the year that God rescued you. Maybe this was the year that God brought you through. Whatever your testimony, your praise is, 
right where you're standing. Just shout, tell God, thank you. Gratitude gives God glory. Gratitude creates capacity for more. Gratitude establishes your story according to God's perfect will. Amen, amen. Amen. One of the things that the body of Christ, that the community of faith is called to do is to celebrate and encourage one another. So we don't know what's going on in anybody else's life or situation. But you know what we can do? We can encourage everybody. So I want you to take a moment just to give God thanks and praise and encourage those who are on your row. Encourage those who are at the altar. Encourage those who are in the pulpit area because we all need it. Thank you, God. Play right there, Maestro. Play right there. Play right there. Let us call on the name of the Lord. You can continue to sing softly and let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you now that we have been able to gather in this sacred space one more time. This season, you all at your seats, you may be seated. You may be seated. Pray, where, pray at your seats. We have been able to come together in this season, this season of revival that has stirred within us a heightened expectation of faith, a heightened expectation of a divine movement in our situation. Oh God, I thank you right now for those who have gathered around this altar with great enough faith to say I believe and God help my unbelief. To say I believe and I expect God you to do what you have promised and I just want to tell you thank you in advance. Thank you for blessing my family. Thank you for pulling those loose ends together. Thank you for covering those who have found themselves outside the ark of safety. Thank you, oh God, for giving direction to those who are lost. Thank you, oh God, for placing your hand upon us just to remind us that you're still with us, walking with us, talking with us, reminding us that we belong to you. Oh God, let us know that our trouble won't last always. Remind us, oh God, that weeping may endure for a night, but joy, joy, joy is coming in the morning. Thank you, God, for replenishing us when life has beaten us down. Thank you, God, for restoring us when we have made mistakes. Thank you, God, for bringing us back into the fold, for making things right, for cleansing us, renewing us, building us up. Oh, God, we thank you right now. I pray, Heavenly Father, for every family represented in this room this afternoon. I pray, God, for the family relationships that they be strengthened all the more. I pray, oh, God, that restoration and reconciliation happen where there is brokenness and disconnection and disunion. I pray, oh, God, that where folks have become downtrodden, where folks have become discouraged, I pray, God, that you lift up their heads I pray, God, that you give them a renewed and revised vision. I pray, oh God, that you cause your spirit to strangely warm them on the inside, that they know that they've been in the presence of the Lord. I pray, oh God, that whatever the prayer requests and the needs are that have been unuttered, that have been unvocalized, Oh, God, that you meet it right now according to your perfect and divine will. I pray, oh, God, that you loose what needs to be loose. I pray, oh, God, that you bind up those elements that need to be bound, that your people might be free. I thank you for redemption. I thank you for your holiness. I thank you for your plans. I thank you, oh, God, that you've had your mind on us, that you have your hand on us. That you're turning and you're touching, you're teaching and you're lifting and you're bringing us the victory. 
Oh God, we commend this worshiping congregation into your perfect and divine care. I pray for the pastor of this house, Lord, that you might bless the labor of his hands. I pray for the pastor of this church, Lord, that you might touch his mind, God. Give him creative abilities to do what he's never done before, but what you've given him the capacity to do. I pray, oh God, that you touch this preacher, that he may provide faithful leadership, God, in every area of life, where there may be lack, God, build it up. Where there are strengths, God, accentuate. I pray for this congregation, Lord, who are praying for revival, who are praying through revival, who are praying as a result of revival. Thank you, God, for touching them. Thank you, God, for inspiring them. Thank you, God, for stirring up within them gifts, graces, and glory that they may exemplify your face, your will, your hands, your feet, your love, wherever they might go. I pray, oh God, that all of these prayers be done according to your perfect and divine will. In your divine timing and in your way, we count it done by faith. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Shout amen, 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 amen. and amen. amen. You may arise and go in peace and go in faith. Yes, yes. Over. The folks Thank God for the recharge and the reset. It's one of my favorite stories, and I am just grateful to be in this Bible teaching community. And I pray that it refresh you. I'm going to give you another reminder, a prescription. Holland Chapel, you've been given our marching orders to shout change their story. I love that story because Jesus was just passing by. The man got a freebie because he knew that Jesus was there. And we need to recognize that Jesus has been in this place. And we ought not let Jesus ever come through here and just pass by. And every time we get in here, we ought to always shout. Amen. Amen. And certainly, I, have, I hope you all have felt strangely warm and been blessed. We've been blessed by the Mel Choir that sang. We have been blessed by Mr. Chapel's praise team. We thank you all as well for coming. <laughs> we thank you for the wonderful members of Mitchell Chapel that's here. Amen. And the wonderful members of Holland Chapel. God, we, we are thankful for you staying. Um, this morning we had a wonderful meal prepared by the kitchen committee. Sister Murdy Powell, she was here. Will you wave your hand? Let's give God praise for her and what she's done. Um, the men even helped set up. Some of you that were here, they set up all of the locations, the tent, and made sure everything was accommodating to us. Please you give them a hand clap as well. When I was trying to get everybody, I may have missed a, a lot of folks that when I was up here um, getting ready for service, but um, to those that labor in ministry, Minister Gail Dunstan, she's there, wave your hand, everybody sees you, amen, God bless you, God bless you, Minister Vincent McCullers, he's in the back there, we started this journey together as well, he's a definitely a great man of God, and I'm glad to see you, God bless you. Uh, also, Sister Rada Fox, our, penny, our district penny brigade coordinator. Amen. Am I saying that right? Amen. We thank you for here. Thank you for joining. And she shares love from Corinth. And, uh, her, and, and not right now, you're uh, our elders interim pastor.
Amen. Amen. So, so both of them was in, in Mark chapter 10. This morning I was in Mark chapter 5. <laughs> I said, I hope he don't preach my message. I don't want him to make me look bad. I hope he going up a chapter or two or something. And I was like, oh, thank God, chapter 10, okay. Because I was going to pull him and say, well, maybe could you do a little bit of something else? <laughs> I'm crazy like that. He knows. Amen. Amen. And to all the family here, y'all, you know, I have some nicknames. I had to t- take me a while not to say your nickname, but Branchon and a lot my, my father-in-law. Glad to see you as well, and all of you all, and and my sister Tita. You know, I'm just glad to see family. Like he said, there's nothing like family. There's nothing like family. And if you have family, and your family can also be your friends, you really got something going. Sometimes you don't get both. All right, that's a sermon. Come meet me two Sundays from now, and I'll have that prepared for you. <laughs> we, we're going to title that. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that si- We'll work on that sermon. Um, but I um, really thank all everyone that was here. Did I miss anyone? Just so we're clear. And, of course, our ministers here, Brother Lumford, come on, raise your hand. He's here, one of our ministers here, as well as Reverend Wilson. You know, we made mention, he made mention of her. I didn't even know that connection there. And that's a praying woman. Praying woman, praying woman. I think one, she's, so, she's, she, she's praying so much. I think I called her one day, see how you're doing. And we just started speaking in tongues. I said, well, we, uh, we're going we're gonna to eat. And she just went in and prayed. And I received it. I said, listen, hey, any time you want to pray. And so he even though she's been a prayer warrior back then. So I know uh, that you have really helped a lot, and um, and I was glad you were able to be here, and didn't miss that that kudos to you. And so you never know sometimes when you've done work, people are paying attention, and people have benefited, and you never know at any point when somebody want to give the flowers to you, you know. And so uh, I'm grateful that Reverend Little, even though we're getting a little older, he did remember that. <laughs> so <laughs> he did. that wasn't bad, was it? What I said. <laughs> okay, time to wrap up. Well, thank you again. God bless you. Continue to bless you. I'm gonna let him come up. Um, first, first, want to do this. We didn't um, do this a little earlier in the program, but I want you to get. If you haven't done so, I want you to reach out and get a seed, and, and I want you to get a seed right now, an offering. Now, what we've done here at at Holland is that we have taken up the offering when you leave. But I want to take a moment for you to make a committed decision to give. Giving is a part of our worship. When they gave in Old Testament time, they had to give the animal they had raised that was sacred to them, an animal they had raised and fed, and they had to give it, and they had to have it slain on the altar. Could you imagine taking your own animal that you have fed over time and cared and, and sometimes with us, you know, that, that piece of dollars, it, it just seemed like it stuck to our hand. It's, it's just stuck, and when we give it, it's folded and folded up, and we got to iron it out in the back. <laughs> Let it go. Let it go. It's going to be all right. God's going to bless you. I want to pray for you in your offering. Gracious God, I pray that you bless Every offering, whether how we see it small or big, God, you see it the same. You see it as a sacrifice. You see it as being obedient. And I pray, Lord, that when they release this, God, it uh, continues to activate their faith. It continues to show, God, that they're committed that money is not an idol. Money does not have them captive. They give because they believe that when they give, they shall receive. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember, have your seat with you. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. The ushers will get it to you. And then when you leave, there is uh, a basket available you for you to drop it off. I'll ask Reverend Corey Little from Mitchell Chapel AME Zion Church in the great metropolis of Pittsburgh, North Carolina, will please come and give us our benediction. All right. Thank you, sir. I won't be upset that you called me old more than, <laughs> more than one time. <laughs> I just wanted to say to whoever it is that 
I'm parked next to in the visiting minister space right there, there was a car beside that with a whole lot of NC State Wolfpack paraphernalia. I knew it was you. I love it. I love it. I love it. Oh, oh my goodness. Please be quiet. <laughs> Amen. Let us prepare to be dismissed. Uh, we thank God for what our eyes have seen, for what our ears have heard, for the experience that our spirits have been able to enjoy. Now, O oh God, pray that you dismiss us from this setting, but never from your holy and righteous presence. Unto you, Lord, who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before your throne of glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forevermore. The people of God said amen. amen. Consider yourselves blessed and dismissed.